Today we've got Raul, senior environment artist for games, and he currently works at Respawn Entertainment and just recently finished up the game Star Wars Jedi Survivor, which I absolutely loved. And I also loved his other game that he's worked on, the God of War series. We're gonna check out some of that work on his Atmo profile, and he will go over how he did it, his mindset. Um, we talk about his background and how he broke into the game industry. He'll be on our Discord, which is in the description below. And there will also be a link to the rest of his artwork on Atmo for you to check out. And you can check out all the other amazing artwork that's been uploaded recently onto the site. And I would love to see your artwork up there. So create a profile and start building up your environment portfolio. And let's help Atmo grow and, and evolve. So let's get into this. All right, so we have Raul here. That's how you pronounce it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep, we were here for another Atmo interview with a senior environment artist that has worked on some incredible badass games that I personally love. Um, God of War and Star Wars The Jedi Survivor and many others we could talk about. So thanks for coming on, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. It's great stuff. You also, I think you teach at Noman, is that right? Yeah, I, I was teaching at Noman in 2019. I was teaching there for maybe like a year or so. Okay, because I actually studied at Noman many yeah, years yeah. ago. Yeah, I saw on your, on your LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Good old did you Noman Nights. Full class. Full yeah, night. I did the three year. It was like the first time they did the three year uh, oh, wow. stuff over there. Now it's evolved into a full university, it looks like. That's pretty yeah, crazy. That's, uh, such a cool school. Man. I always wanted to go there. Well, now you teach. <laughs> well, yeah, when I got the opportunity to teach there, it, you know, it was even more incredible. But funny enough, I actually start taking my first class there tomorrow. Oh, really? And, uh, what are you going to take? I signed up for a real VFX class because it's the only thing about Unreal I don't know yet. And then they were often there online and through my work. We get like discounts. Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, the yeah. so you're a master in Unreal. I haven't touched Unreal. I'd like to learn Unreal. It's just yeah, so many software really to, cool, to learn, right? Know, there's so much to it. I still don't know a lot of stuff. It's yeah, crazy. the Unreal Five is just crazy. Now, none of the games yeah. that you did before was Unreal Five. That was Unreal Four, right? And then you probably just have your own customized version of Unreal to get it to work even better. Or yeah, I I worked with proprietary engines. And then I think I worked on three games in my career that used Unreal, but Jedi was in some sort of special Unreal 4 engine. That's cool. No, it's interesting because we both work at the same game studio, Respawn, <laughs> yeah. and yet we have no clue who each other are because <laughs> of the whole remote work stuff. Like we're, yeah, I'm, exactly, with Apex, I'm with Apex Legends, you're with uh, the Star Wars, and <laughs> no, yeah it's, no. a, it's a crazy thing man when i when you reached out to me i saw that you worked at respawn and i thought that was very cool but also weird because i have no idea who you were <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know you're the first game artist that i have on here interviewing so we got congratulations on that man <laughs> do, do i get like a medal or yeah you popped the cherry <laughs> <laughs> so how'd you get into games and all this stuff what's your story what's your your background there i always like playing video games since i was little and yeah. it was always my dream to make them so the very first thing i ever did was with this game called max Payne. max Payne. Out that you could use this thing called photoshop and then you could change the textures of the characters and put your face in the game so I, oh, spend, that's cool. I, I can't tell you how many hours on the weekends doing all kinds of silly things just for me. But <laughs> how old were you at the time? I think I was like 16 or something. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's this, cool. this was back when there were no tutorials or anything. You just kind of mm -hmm. had to, like YouTube didn't even exist. And if it did, I didn't know about it. From that, I, I just learned more 3D. And then eventually I, I started taking classes at the local community college. And then I met a group of people because there was a worship called a bunch of short guys. And this is back in Dallas, Dallas, Texas. So okay. they were in a bunch of short guys that it was just called a bunch of short guys. <laughs> the, the idea there that it was a little hobbits running around shorts. Yeah, <laughs> no, but it was a very cool group that got together once a month to talk about stuff. 
so from there I got hooked up and then I landed my first gig at a, at a local tiny mama papa shop called LMNX Creative and then they pretty much did commercials and movies and stuff like that and it was pretty cool man it was such a small team and I got my hands in everything I could you could possibly think of and from there I realized that I really just wanted to make games right work in the movies as fun as it was too hectic for me the deadlines were freaking insane and I was like I feel like every Wednesday and Thursday I was working super late because the thing had to be done by the next Monday and I just couldn't handle it anymore but also I wanted to work on games and id software was uh, one of the local big studios the crazy is you I always thought that a place that gets software would be like in California because you know growing up in a small town in the Midwest I never I don't know to me all the cool stuff was in California and Hollywood yeah no I, I yeah. totally get what you're saying yeah <laughs> you think when you're I in, in town out, yeah when I found out that it's software was like 10 minutes that way I actually drove through it expecting to find this hellish building Instead, it was like a regular looking building. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. But well, yeah, I worked there for a little bit. And then, yeah, from there, I just kept going through my career in the gaming industry. All right, cool. So have you wanted to maybe jump into film, TV, or virtual reality or anything? Yeah, I mean, every once in a while, I, I thought about it. And then there had been opportunities. And I have worked on projects. I, while I was working at it, software... I was unfortunately laid off, but that gave me the opportunity to work on random freelance for like almost six months or something. And I must have done all kinds of stuff for all kinds of movies. Like I can't even tell you. And half of the stuff I didn't even make the big screen, but I got paid for it. I'm happy. But I don't know. To me, games is where my passion has always been. Yeah. And it's such a different environment, depending on the company, obviously, because yeah. you know, not, not all the companies are the same. But I was very fortunate to work at places where they take their time and they put the time to make the game look good. And the game it takes a long time to flesh this stuff out. So you just know that you're going to work on this for five years. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the best work you can do. You know, well, it becomes your baby. Take, yeah. Instead of having three hours to make this insane thing, and then you're like, oh, yeah. well, how am I going to make this in three hours? I don't even know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The commercials is really fast. Film, it's weird. Like, you'll have moments where it's really fast, and other moments where you're spending on it forever. And you're like, okay, I guess this is a, a yeah. thousand times slower. And then TV is just fast, also. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I remember when we used to, when I used to work at this place, one of our clients was Porsche. And we basically handle their website. So the architects will send the Porsche cars. And it was such a fun thing for me back then because I didn't know how to model that well to be able to open the AutoCAD model. Yeah, and, yeah. And, but, <laughs> but also it was insane because like basically whatever they requested needed to be done right away. Like we, the turnaround was always so fast and it never left any important needing to do anything creative with more yeah we're just there to make money yeah yeah it's you brought up the whole thing of you finding new opportunities when you get laid off and i think that's a really important topic to talk about especially now since the turmoil of everything game studios yeah. film tv the strikes the economy everything and i think it's i know it's very hard to not stay positive through it all but there's always these opportunities that you'll just find. Like you don't have to be doing film. You don't have to be doing games. You can find these like little niche things that you would have never even thought of, right? And you, and you get these cool, unique opportunities. There's even people that do animations for medical stuff and they're just yeah, making yeah. some good money and it's just different, right? You can, it's, there's a ton of different opportunities in the world when you become a, like a generalist type of artist. But even yeah, if you're not yeah. a generalist, I'm sure there's other things. Yeah, it really sucks. It's very unfortunate to come to work and find out that you no longer have a job. Yeah, yeah. You know? we've all been so, through it. That's for sure. Blindsided. A, <laughs> yeah, it's such a terrible feeling when you come to work happy and ready to go do whatever you need to do. And you find out you no longer have a job. And I think sometimes it's not so much that like you don't have a job. You're more like, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, did I do something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but and then people react to it differently. 
I've been laid off maybe three times in my career, and each time has been a little depressing at first, but it's almost like a blessing in disguise. Yep, exactly. It's almost like they did me a favor because obviously if the company had laid off, it's because something wasn't working. Yeah. So and each, yeah. And then also the opportunity to increase your rate as well. Yeah. That, that's yeah, the fastest exactly. way to increase it is by going to other studios instead of waiting for promotions. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of benefits to being laid off. Obviously, there's like the whole thing where, oh, shit, I'm not going to get paid. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's I, think scary. That, I you know, think that once you get over that and you like line up your ducks and you know what you want to do about it, then that's when you realize that, oh, OK, this is cool. I have all this. I have a world of opportunities now that I didn't have before because when I got laid off the first time from id software, for example, it was very unfortunate. And, but I realized that I was very burnt out. I didn't realize how burnt out I was until I wasn't working. I think I slept the entire week after I got laid off. And maybe it was a little bit, obviously, well, probably from being depressed that I got laid off, but because working there to me, it was like the biggest, yeah. the biggest, because it was my first big industry job. And yeah, back then id software was id software. You were there, you were like a rock star. Yeah. They're still pretty big and cool. It's just now there's other places. But the point there, though, is that once I got a hold of my bearings and I started poking people, a lot of doors opened and I had the opportunity to try new stuff. I got to work with games. I mean, not games, movies. I got to do like quick jobs here and there. This one guy was paying me like money to make cell phones because <laughs> he was making commercials for Nokia. Oh, that's cool. So, how how they find but, you? That's such a random freelance gig. <laughs> that's the thing, man. Because I was going through this thing called a bunch of short guys and okay. the local community in Dallas, I knew a lot of people. So I legit just went through my whole Facebook list going, hey, sorry for being a shitty friend and disappearing on you for like a year <laughs> or so. But, how uh, can you help me? <laughs> I can need a job. And then some people were very cool. And then immediately they're like, yeah, actually, you know what? I'm doing this thing right now. And then if you don't mind me helping, it might not pay you much, but you can help. And I'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then other people were actually even nicer. They actually set me up with legit interviews with other studios, you know? Oh, wow. And then that's yeah, that's like, the thing. When I started realizing how big the opportunities could be. And I stopped being depressed about the fact that I didn't work at it anymore. And I was more excited about what could be. Yeah. I know it's, it's an amazing community to build those relationships and you're actually skillful at it. We all understand that this is just a thing that studios do. They hire too much. They're done with the project. And they're like, all right, we're done with you kind of thing. Right. It's not usually about your skill. Sometimes, sure, it could be your skill if you're like a junior or something, and maybe they're like, that's too much money to hire a junior, but maybe it's not even about the skill, actually. But most of the time, yeah, you get your feet back up. Everyone's there to help you out. There's so many different studios now to check out. It's, it is definitely, that's why it's good to have an, a little nest egg just in case to get you through those times. But yeah, no, that's it definitely for me, whenever I got laid off, it was like, okay, where do I go now? <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an interesting world. This, it's not your typical industry. This is what I'm trying to say. It's like other yeah, like, uh, uh, fields. It might be like this person had a horrible personality or something, right? But this just yeah. happens. It's just so common in our industry that is they're not going to instantly just think, oh, what, what's, why did they fire you? That's not going to be the question in an interview at all. They just talk about your work. Oh, your work is awesome in your next interview. They're not going to be like, so why'd you get laid off? That's not going to, that won't even come up in the conversation, in the interview conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, now that you say that every time I had a rebound interview, as I call them, no one asked me, oh, wait, did you like, were you mean or something? Everybody's more <laughs> interested in get to know me. Yeah. And, and, and every time that stuff has made me feel better. You know? Yeah. So how'd you land into the, the God of War? So, that one was very cool and interesting. I was working at id Software. So I started out at id Software as an intern and I made my way up to being full time and everything. And so back then, before our station and all the other websites existed, the only website that game artists usually 
will post the work with called Paul account. Which will and soon be at mo vfx.com for everyone out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the, the thing is that the community in Paul account was very strong and then very popular, right? So what I had what I was doing is that even though I had a job already, even though I was working, I would come home after my shift at it and uh, basically work my butt off on my portfolio because the guys that did software, they were fucking good. Like those guys were godly. They still are. The things that they did and they do is just amazing. So I need, I knew that if I wanted to be full time there, I needed to be able to do what they did. So I would come home and put in another six hours every night. And so anyway, if the point of that, one of the guys from Sony saw that and then he reached out and then at the time, I was fighting very hard to get a full time at it. So, moving to California and all that stuff wasn't exactly something I wanted to do because it was scary. Yeah, going from Dallas to California was, to me, was very scary. Yeah, and and so I, I told him thank you, and then I I didn't, you know, like I just kept doing my thing at it, and then I used that as an excuse to say, well, all these places are interested in hiring me, and then. Eventually, after working my butt off and plus probably like some of that, like I, I would make full time. So I was very happy with that. But later, like a couple of years later, when I got laid off one more time from this other place, <laughs> just it was such a funny, weird timing, man. I saw that this guy, his name is Nate Stephens, the same guy that tried to reach out to me before. He's our art director on the Jedi project, by the way. He, he posted because he was the lead environment artist at Sony Santa Monica and he posted that they were looking for gods. That's what he said on his LinkedIn. They were looking for gods to join the Sony Santa Monica art. <laughs> and then I told him something along the lines of, I'm just a mere mortal, but I would love to be <laughs> here. And, uh, and then uh, to my surprise, by the end of the week, I was interviewing with them. And then at the time, no one knew that they were making God of War. When I went to the interview, when they flew me to LA and everything, it, it, it was like, it was very exciting. Wait, they flew you in me. for the interview or was it a phone interview? No, at first it was a phone interview, but okay. then eventually, back then we still went, we're going to the office. This is like, a, yeah, eventually when they flew me in and I was at the studio and everything, I was like super excited. <laughs> yeah, I got it. This has to happen. Yeah. Like, I don't know, I'll bring them donuts. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I need to get higher. So, yeah, I'm very thankful that happened that way. I think Stephens, he's been a very good friend and a great mentor for me. And he gave me, him and the other guys gave me the opportunity to join the God of War team. But at the time, I didn't know that's what we were making. Oh, okay. I mean, I knew we were making a God of War game, but I didn't know it was going to be like the most acclaimed. Oh, I see what you're Yeah. It was kind of looking insane. And yeah, so that was cool. So I stayed there for a long time and now I'm a respawn. Yeah, but, it's uh, interesting. Yeah. When I was playing the Star Wars, the Jedi Survivor, and I was like, certain parts reminds me of God of War. Like the style, <laughs> a little bit of it. <laughs> I was like, and then the puzzles also. And I was like, huh. And then I, I was talking to someone at work. I was like, you guys think it's uh, uh, similar to God of War? It's like, Oh yeah, we hired a bunch of God of War people. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's very interesting. So before we came, a lot of the people that had worked on the previous God of War games had already come to Respawn, and then they were working on the Jedi games. So Stig, for example, the game director, he he was like the the, the big mastermind behind the God of War. Um, and all the because he before he was a game director he was the environment artist so he was the one pushing for all the crazy shit that God of War has yeah and so it's a good thing it, the game's yeah, so good yeah <laughs> yeah so that's why there's so and a lot of similarities and of course there's other guys like Jason one of the designers he he also came from Sony Santa Monica and then like a bunch of names right yeah. So it was cool going from Sony Santa Monica to Respawn. I felt like I didn't, I felt like I was still at Sony because it was the same 
culture. <laughs> People, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. The only thing that was different is that now we legit all work from home. And I really like working from home because it's very comfortable. And yep. And it's cool. I do miss the bathroom breaks and then the, the chit chat. <laughs> yeah. The that's camaraderie. The and that's the yeah. thing that I've been, I love working from home. I love the opportunities it gives me, et cetera, et cetera. But there is that camaraderie that I do miss because I was just talking about this actually this morning, how when you're talking to someone video to video, sure, you become friendly with them, but it's hard to really build that intimate friendship, that yeah, real yeah. bonding when you're not there in person, but you're missing even just the smell of the person, like <laughs> as creepy as it sounds, like you're missing all those human things, right? <laughs> no, that's true, man. I'm one of those people that I, I like to go to people's desk and, uh, yeah. like, you know, get on, up on, on their faces about what they're doing. And yeah, no, totally. Person. I'm the same way. I, I love yeah. hanging out, like learning. And then it's also quick to be like, Hey, how do you do this real quick? Instead of waiting on the chat. Yeah, exactly. And then working from home makes that a little harder, but there's other ways to do it. But it is true. It yeah. is harder to develop a relationship with your coworkers. And one of the things I appreciate about the Jedi team is that everybody's very chill. Yeah. And if I ask anyone if they can get on a call with me, they always make time for me and they show yeah, me no, stuff sure. I need to see. Yeah, yeah I mean, response to great like studio. Yeah. I mean, I feel like everybody is so relaxed and if they need to speak up, they do it. And then, but it's never like in a negative way. It's always towards the good end. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, but for me, it was very hard adjusting to working from home fully. Cause like when we were at Sony and then the pandemic happened, we thought that it was just going to be like a weekend thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, sure. Go have a five day weekend guys. Yeah. We'll be there the next Monday. And then two years later, we were still yeah. working from home. And, uh, <laughs> no, I remember dude, that they had us come in to pick up all the equipment from our desks. And I'm not one of the people that decorate my desk too much. Like I have a cool couple of action figures here and there, but there were some guys that had a whole set of. Yeah. The they shit. make it their home because you're there yeah. and most of your day in this spot. <laughs> so you might, yeah. as well make, you might as well make it your home. Yeah. And it's very hard to go and basically part ways with that word. Like. For a while, my office at home looked like the Matrix. I had all the cables everywhere and everything was just upside down. And like the dip kit was on the floor. And then it was like, eventually I figured out my groove and yeah. things got back to normal in quotes. But um, yeah, once I got three yeah. monitors set up, I was like, okay, I can do <laughs> yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. So for me, it was hard because we had to have a dip kit. So that's like a whole nother deal and yeah. on top of having your own computer. Mm -hmm. And then there's so many fucking cables. It took me like three days just to be able to get all that working. Because <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> figure out the instructions, what cable went where and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. But I'm okay with it. Instead of becoming a creature or a hard surface modeler, how do you become just like the environment artist? What made you choose to be the environment artist? Was it just, this is the job and this is where I'm, it's leading me to or? No, yeah, but so what happened was when I was working at this movie studio, we were generalists and sometimes I would do character stuff and sometimes I would do other things, right? Mm -hmm. But I was never good at any of those things. I was just okay at them. Mm -hmm. And when I mean okay, I mean I was like very good at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. one day I, I met one of the character artists that did software in one of these meetings I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. And so his portfolio was fucking mind blowing. And I was like, wow, I, I could never do that. <laughs> and now look but at you he, now. <laughs> but he told me this. He goes, you can do anything you want as long as you practice, right? Yeah. And so the deal there was that he told me, well, don't you work on your portfolio and then get the foundations down, but like use props instead of characters. And then that way you'll get the, all the, the, the sub demodeling and the texturing and all the stuff that you need to be able to do the job. Once you're in, you can choose what path you want to do. Right. What happened was I came in and I, I realized that there were two character artists and they were like pointy environment artists. I wasn't going to compete with the two guys that were there making the coolest shit that anyone's ever seen. So I learned my place in the earth, right? My place in the world was to just 
stick to making rocks and trims. <laughs> I mean, I never it never crossed my mind to make characters, to be honest. Yeah. Like, maybe it crossed my mind to make statues because the statues are cool, and then I would like to yeah. make some kind of pretty environment that has statues. But yeah. making characters just sounds very stressful. Like, there are so many eyes on them and stuff like that, so it just never really call me that much. Yeah. Like, it's different if I'm going to do, like, a personal project and I want to 3D print it and or whatever, but I wouldn't necessarily make a character to put in front of the face of the game. Right. Yeah. Like creators, for example, I mean, Rafael Grossetti is one of the best sculptors. Yeah, you're not going to compete against him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that guy has so much talent. I don't even know. Like, creators is an arm, man. I remember when they got that working well. And I mean, I mean, creators is arm has more moving parts than any environment in the game. Cradle actually had muscles and was forming skin. And then Raphael wasn't just a sculptor. He was also very technical. He and the rest of the animators, riggers, and who knows who else figure all that stuff out. And I like being an environment artist because it's just me making stuff. Yeah. Like, uh, when I started working on Jedi Survivor, legit, they were just like, hey, man, here's a concept. Have fun. I'm like, okay. And then I didn't talk to anyone for a month or so, and then things just started coming up. Yeah. Of course, I always talk to the designers and everything, but uh, to me, it's just less pressure, and, and yeah. it's fun, too. You get to make more, in a way, right? So it's just more relaxed. And the other thing is that it's you get variation, right? So if you're stuck on a character, you're working on that char- single character for a long time. And then you have to work for all the work on all the deformations for the animations, right? With environments, you can go from stone to a terrain interiors to house to wood yeah. and different styles. And so it keeps things it keeps you on your toes. More diversity. Yeah. One of the things I liked about working on God of War is that it was all set in the God of War universe, which is basically lots of rocks and wood. But then there's also metals and stuff. Yeah. And then there's all the cool moving parts and all the temples and all the things. But yeah, right. <laughs> there's a certain charm to everything. And then you just, as long as you understand that, you don't have to get too crazy, right? So when I started working on Star Wars, I had to basically learn the, the art style. And it, it was very refreshing. Like I felt like something in my mind clicked, like a, a, a gear that I've never moved in years. <laughs> Finally started moving. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. So I can basically use the same techniques, but I can do this instead. You know? Yeah. So, so that was kind of cool. That's great. That's great. So you mentioned that you're teaching, right? How f- that must be like super fulfilling for you, right? To see people grow yeah. and maybe get their first job after your class. Or what do you like about teaching? And what do you actually teach them exactly? Curious. So when I was teaching at the Noman workshop, I was teaching, I'm sorry, in the Noman school, not the Noman workshop. Um, yeah. I was teaching in the environment class. So it was 12 painful weeks of me telling them how to scope and make cool environments. And, mm-hmm. and I say painful because making an environment is a shit ton of work. Yeah. And then somehow the kids were able to do it. Right. That's and the Noman then, way. Yeah. <laughs> you stay up all night and get it done. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes what, what, I, what I will find even more impressive is that some of them have other classes too. And then uh-huh. Yeah. They were putting the same amount of love into whatever yeah. they were making and all mm-hmm. this stuff just looked amazing. But my, my favorite part of teaching is basically seeing someone going from having what the fuck face to actually understanding the process yeah and and then and spin it around and make something with that knowledge and then sometimes i've had kids for example who had never touched zbrush until they took my class or maybe they had taken my class but they haven't they, they don't know how to use it for making something like a rock right yeah so it was very cool always to just see how because i would make them a lot of videos and stuff which mm-hmm. most of the teachers didn't Right. And so they will watch all these videos and then some of them were smart and then they will follow the video frame by frame and then they will get the same results I did. And the, the other kids, they eventually figured it out, but it was very cool to see how everybody just collectively helped each other. Yep. 
And and because that was the first thing I would tell my students, I would tell them, okay, none of that competition shenanigans in my class. Like all of you will eventually work at the same place, so you gotta learn how to be nice to each other. Because I feel like uh, our school is is very common to have competition with your, your classmates. Yeah. And it's something that I feel like that's unnecessary. So I will see how some of them will help each other. And then I will see how some of them will just go above and beyond and just make very cool stuff. And to me, that was very like fulfilling because at the end of the 12 weeks, seeing everybody going from zero to a thousand was like, like a very beautiful feeling. I was like, you, you touch someone's life. And yeah. You change their life. You, yeah, I don't think that can get it can get better than that. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, even for the kids who didn't like what I was saying, eventually they come back to me and say, "Hey, you know that thing I didn't understand?" Now, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'd be like, "Yeah, totally, great." <laughs> you know. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah teaching is uh, it's you know, you're teaching basically how to walk, and yeah, it's so fulfilling. Know, te- te- teaching is hard because you have to learn how to talk to each individual differently. Yep. You can't just show up to class and talk for an hour and expect everybody to understand stuff. I would, what I would do is like, I will talk and then I will sit down one by one afterwards and I will help them individually because I wouldn't spend any time outside of class talking to anybody. And that's why I would make videos for them. And then sometimes I knew that the kids needed more help, but that I will tell them because I will teach on a Saturday, so I will tell them, look, I can be here all day if you need help. But other than that, I don't know what to tell you, right? Yeah. Uh, answering emails about students asking for help is very taxing and, and just, yeah, it can be hard, right? So there's like pros and cons to teaching. For sure. Now what I do is I, I take up on just individual mentorships. Okay. And then. I only focus on one person at a time and it's usually eight weeks. And then usually so far, everybody I've done, I've worked with their professionals easier because they already know what they want to do and they just want to get better at that one thing, which is usually sculpting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, have a little bit and I tell them a couple of things and then they turn around with the cool shit that they make and I'm like, oh, right. <laughs> so these are, you're actually working with people that are in the industry already? Yeah, I do one-on-one mentorships just online. Uh, do you have a site for that? Or like, how do you hook that up? It's just, just by word of mouth. Word of mouth, okay. I, I don't yeah. want to make it into an actual business. <laughs> <laughs> you have time because for that it, shit. <laughs> yeah, because it's the same thing, right? It's, it takes a long time, right? So yeah. it's usually you, you, I talk to them for an hour and then once a week and then they come back and do stuff. Yeah, I mean, I know there's places like uh, there's the coalition with Josh Flinch. He's one of my friends, all co-workers. Like he, he does a whole mentorship program. He's got like a whole staff of guys that specialize in teaching. Yeah. But I don't know. That's not my goal. My goal is to like if someone hits me up and go, hey, can you give me a demo for an hour? I'm always happy to do it. That's cool. All right. So you want to jump over to your work then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me share my screen. All righty. So this is the Atma website, basically a place where environment artists can display their work and get reference images and everything like that. And when I'm saying, I don't know if many people know this, but when you're going through, like the home screen is all like the high quality senior work. And, but when I'm saying reference images, you can look at all these images. And if you have a specific project and you're searching for the say like mountains or something, you can type in the keyword. And then once you find a cool image, you can actually hit here and say new library or add it to an existing folder. So if you have a project to say God of war, you can make God of war folder and just be like, Oh, this is inspiration. Let me add some reference board kind of thing. Mm, Um, and of course you got the fancy little black and white button to check out the values, see what the pros are doing with the values and everything. Your profile over here, bad boy 3D. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my, uh, online handle. <laughs> <laughs> you got the badass Jedi survivor, God of War and God of War Ragnarok. And I've played all three and I've loved all three. So let's go in order then. <laughs> let's start yeah, with yeah. the first God of War. Yeah, I only I didn't submit all my work. 
in there because I was trying to figure out the website and all that, but I'll put more stuff in there later. Okay. It, I remember you mentioned the button up here. I removed that I to make it I, more I clear that it's the, the order of operation. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, we've originally, like, I have the site open for people just to upload images, even for non-Atmo seniors. Like, or just if it's not your personal work, you can upload other people's work and just say it's unknown or give credit to them. And it won't populate to your profile. It just helps build the, the reference library that I'm trying to build, right? So that's why I, mean, I had... I think it's a cool website. I saw, I saw some works in there I haven't seen in a while. Cool. So it will ultimately become the ultimate portfolio reference site oh, for environment yeah. artists. <laughs> and yeah, so let's check it out. Yeah, yeah. This is sick. You can also, the thing about the size that you can upload as big as resolution as you want. So I could click on this twice and it would get bigger, go to the full size oh, and you yeah. pan around on it. So this was obviously a zebra sculpt. Do you use other software? What are, do you touch blender at all? Yeah, I use blender daily. Yeah. You do use Blender? I haven't touched. Ugh, I really do need to mess with Blender. Blender's awesome, man. Once you go Blender, you never go back to anything that's not different. But I know I keep hearing it. Uh, so Blender, I like it because it's newer and it, it just has a lot of stuff that the other programs don't have. So I'm more on the mindset of working with a certain method, so I can pretty much jump into any program and spend a day, and then I figure stuff out, and then I do what I need to do. But yeah, everybody's different, but I, I like Blender a lot. This stuff here that was done with Maya. Okay. Uh, so you sculpted you it see, in Maya? No. So okay. what, you, what you're seeing here, is, uh, this is in engine. It's not a render using R or anything yeah, like yeah. that. It's an actual in renderer of what it actually looks like in the game. So what you're seeing is a collection of modular assets that have materials applied to them. There's decals, vertex painting, and for example, all the little rocks on the floor back then, you have to place them by hand, so I'll go in one at a time and do it. But like, you everything didn't use I like a, a, a scatter paintbrush or anything or any yeah. procedural type of stuff? No, because I like to be efficient about it. I place the rocks. The, the scene is lit a certain way, so I would... I usually like to use the rock angle to catch the light so that it looks nice. If you use something procedural, you can, but then it just looks like someone spilled all the beans in the floor and then it just doesn't look like anything. Right? Yeah. Of course, you can spend like a long time with the procedural tools and rules to make it right. But for this kind of thing, setting up the, the little rocks, that, that was like the icing on the cake. So I didn't mind spending 30 minutes just doing it. Right. So you're talking about these rocks right here? That, yeah. So you're not talking about the little tiny pebbles? No, so that's just a plane. Okay, okay. So, so that's, that's what I was plane. actually referring to with scattering. So it's there's a lot of layers here of, of detail. So basically that's a plane that just has a timing texture on it. And then I just little, if you were to click that in my legit four polygons, yeah. So it's all a trickery. It's like smokes and mirrors, man. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is the difference between games and film, right? Yeah. Films go in there, put it all in there, put as much geometry you want. <laughs> or games, you yeah. have to hack things and, and fake things until, unless you're using Nanite on Unreal 5. <laughs> but well, yes and no. <laughs> okay. Because you, you still have to be mindful of performance and 50 other things that go with development. I mean, nowadays, sure, I could I'd probably actually add all the little pebbles and stuff in there. But it all comes back to what I was just saying. Like, are people actually going to see it? No. So, yeah. So, I, I like to... So, the way I do things is that I actually play the game when I'm making stuff. Some mm -hmm. you know, Sometimes people, they just build their scenes on the fly because they're so cool and fast and, and they're not <laughs> done with it. <laughs> but I don't do that. Like I actually craft my scene and then I play it like people will play at their house. And then based on what you the player camera, that's how I go and I, I arrange all this, the small stuff, you know, all the, all the big things that you see on the screen. So I didn't just go and paint things or, or play the rock just because I actually will play the game and then I will tweak it in real time with cradles walking around and I will move a rock just a little higher so that I could catch 
the lighting more. See, that's that? passion. That's yeah. passion and and determination. I, I like. That's. I mean, how else are you gonna make the best? See, to me, I go back to the days of Ray Harryhausen. He was the he's considered Hello? the grandfather of stop motion. And one of the things I love about watching his films, man, is that he would just make everything and everything would just be like handcrafted and stuff. So to me, this is the closest I'm going to get to be able to do that because the art is dead, right? So when I'm working on all this, like any level I make, I legit do that. I always play with the player and I'm moving stuff around until it's nice. But what that does is that basically it also allows you to keep an eye on performance I think I got disconnected. Hello. All right, we got cut out there. We're back at it. What were you saying? Sorry about that. To, to keep it short, <laughs> I, I was just saying that when, yeah, like doing something like this just took a little effort because I wanted it to be the highest quality we could possibly do. When I, yeah. when I was working at the Sony Santa Monica, one of the reasons why I wanted to work there is because those guys you know, are very passionate about making the highest quality of art possible. I just this was my way of saying thank you for letting me work here kind of thing, but also to, to show off that all the crazy stuff you can do when people trust you. Yeah. yeah. There is some game terminology that it'd be great if you could actually explain that because I personally, I do Skybox, right? So it's a completely different oh, world yeah, yeah. Of, what, of what you're doing. And a lot of the listeners are from film and TV and they would actually, especially since what's been going on in the world today, would actually learn to transition into games. That's a big topic of conversation now with a lot of artists. So if you could actually define, like you said, decals, you said modular, yeah, are you using so that in here the, as well? The, the previous corner we were looking at is actually those stairs where you have your mouse under. So, so over here? Yeah. So the previous shot was of me zooming in. Because oh, okay. That, that, cool. Yeah. So this shot is, so basically, so let me describe this. Let me start over. Um, so basically, you go inside of a big mountain, and then the goal there is to get to the top to release the mother's ashes for those who haven't played the game. Yeah. So you, you, the mountain is a huge mountain. It's hollow. It's like the mines of Moria in Lord of the Rings. And so modul modularity basically means that you want to reuse assets because you can't really make this badass every time from scratch because it will take you forever. So, yeah. so modularity comes in the form of using assets that have already been done, right? But that doesn't mean that you're just locked to doing the same stuff because if you use the same thing every time, I think they lose their essence. So every room has to have something unique about it. So for example, this room in the game itself, it has a badass like deer statue that one of the other artists did. And so this deer statue activates this laser thing and it opens up a magic door that mm -hmm. lets you go through it. But in this shot, what I'm showing is the stuff I made. So for example, the whole pedal, pedestal stand there, the, the way that works is I sculpted half of it and then I, I mirrored it over, right? But that's a unique asset because it's legit the only time in the entire game that it's used. Yeah. But I want it to be badass because they have this awesome deer statue on top of it. And so the rocks on the side is actually one rock and it looks like a chicken nugget. And so the deal there is that what you're seeing is the rocks on the side on the wall. Those oh. are module. Yeah, that's one rock, but it's one rock that I duplicated maybe 60 times. Okay, cool. And then the look of this cave was such that we wanted the cave to look like it has never been touched by the elements. So all the rock had to be sheer and shell off. Mm -hmm. It wasn't going to look eroded. It was going to look sharp as hell because the wind has never touched it. And then it looked crumbly because pieces of it fell off. Right. So yeah, that's why it looks so sharp. But it didn't look sharp because I wouldn't, it didn't look sharp because I, I wanted to make it look sharp. It was because of, of that kind of look. So if you go and look at another one of my thumbnails there, I'll show you. So that rock there. Yeah. That one. So that rock is a modular piece of rock and it's a certain size so that it can be repeated a lot of times. So what we do is we jam that model a bunch of times to compose the walls that you saw. So in the engine, 
So if you were to open that Maya and you would click on that wall, it would be made up of, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 rocks, yeah. right? And then that's just a very common practice. Now, of course, you could I could have gone in and sculpted a, a, a unique piece and then just put it into place, but that would probably take longer. So a lot of the times if you... you Doesn't it save techniques. memory too? Yeah, so if you use this technique, it saves memory, it's faster, it looks better. Because this asset for back in the, for back then it was high res. Now it could yeah. be high res, but this was still very high res even when you get up close. And I say high res, not that it's like short. I say high res because the geometry of it is high res. I didn't just arbitrarily decimate it, the seabush model. I actually decimate it and then I clean it up so that I try to preserve all the bevels. Yeah that make all the ridges because it was very important the specific that those specific ridges look sharp because that's that was the whole character of the cave. Yeah. So if you go back into the shot, the the rest of it basically comes in the form of lighting. So so I didn't do the lighting. Um, another artist did the lighting. So the lighting basically kind of dictates what the players are going to see. So once we establish what the lighting is, then I can start applying decals and what we call skirts. So decals are basically like when you go online to CG textures and you just find a grime texture. Yeah. So you can grab that and just apply it to it, right? So that's how you start breaking up the monotony of everything because Everything was author very like basic looking, very like monotone, so yeah. that you can then break it up once it's all together in place. So that's what I mean by modularity. So for example, in the background, I have a very heavy architectural facade. That is completely modular because what I did was I sculpted one of the pillars and then it gets reused and then I sculpt all the pieces one by one and then they all get reused and these pieces probably get reused like 300 more times throughout the level. Okay. And if someone needs to make one of these things or whatever, they will know that the pieces exist so they don't have to redo it. At other studios, usually one person does that and another person's job is to put them in the game. But the way that Sony Santa Monica works is that you, you're responsible for all of this. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work, but it basically allows you to get everything looking exactly how it should look, right? Because you, you manage everything, and then if something doesn't look good, because you messed up somewhere. <laughs> well, the thing about modular also is that it's the same shape language, so it'll be consistent yeah, exactly. through the whole thing. So if you were to yeah. try to do different pieces, it's, okay, I have to think about what's the style that I'm looking for that new piece over and over again. Now you can yeah. just hit bash the pieces together, and you're still going to be in the same world. Yeah, that's the word that was looking for, kid bashing. I forgot. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much what you do, right? But you don't want to just kid bash. You want to make sure that things look natural. Yeah. Like this wall on the side, for example, to get that looking like it does here, it probably took me a good day or so. Yeah. You oh, know, for sure. To, and then it wasn't just me. Like I will show it to this guy that was, he's my hero. His name is Paul Coda. He's uh, one of the unsung heroes at Sony Santa Monica. He's, he's been there forever. And then Paul, with one look, will tell me what was wrong with this, right? So I go, hey, Paul, what do you think of this for confirmation? And then we will probably talk about it for an hour and we'll pull up all the references and then we'll tailor it together. And then when he went away, I probably would still work. And then once I have one look established and I know that look work, then I knew what else, what to do in other places. Eventually, you just beat the same process everywhere. And then you get the entire level built, right? So I was in charge of another 20 areas like this. Because it was a pretty big level, right? Yeah, it's really cool. And it's also nice that you have it formed into the ground here. It's not just a straight line. You have it blended, so it, it bevels. Oh, yeah off into there but and, the other thing about this we we wanted it to make it look like it was carved out of a stone and i didn't just want to click things through and then it's very hard to make it look blended into a stone. yeah so did you do so that's the thing right you have this blended so this is this one piece you're saying is modular but it, it would you have to 
merge no, it so into one piece you, or do you have a decal blend thing? So it was not a decal. So we call them skirts. It's basically a ribbon of geometry Okay. that has a vertex paint so that you can adjust the up on it. So it's basically just a little ribbon that you apply to, to make it look like the surfaces are continuous and right. curved or something that's cool yeah, so with vertex yeah. painting that just so the users know it's it's like you take the vertices and you can select those vertices yeah and say, yeah so blend then, the you, alphas. then you go in meticulously like it, this now this little ribbon here might look insignificant but that freaking thing there could be an entire day to perfect right right so, to make it look blended yeah. it's it's tricky <laughs> messing because i have to yeah. do it on my end as well <laughs> and it's just i need to go back and forth okay and, gray and, and light then, gray <laughs> also use an actual image but, but the reason why we use vertex paint is so that we don't have to worry about adding more memory so yes exactly yeah yeah you just keep painting there cool so when you went so now that we've we've oh man that's really cool atmosphere i want to check this out real quick yeah so love, this area for example so here you're in an elevator and you're fighting a freaking dragon the whole way up so there's dragon, uh, so th th this is like a classic ghetto war level where you're starting an elevator and all the bad guys come at you and then you keep making pit stops and then the, the elevator gets stuck on the wall and then create. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was such a very cool moment in the game. And then all the, what, what, uh, so all these little facades in the background. You don't, you never get up close to them, but I built them to scale. And then we never knew, it took me a while to figure out because this, this level here is legit miles and miles long. Like yeah. in real life, this would be like a huge hole and everything is built to scale. So it was very important that it would great. But the problem is that there were a lot of scenes because if you just clip geometry through, through something, you get a lot of scenes. So mm -hmm. if you look closer, you can see that each of the little houses looks like it's been carved out of a wall. Yeah. Like uh, all of them have some sort of blending. And so for that, I meticulously just out of passion, really, I spent who knows how long just making ribbons around a lot of these. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that, so that's a big piece of geometry that's like just clipping through each other, but it has the vertex paint that I was talking about. Yeah. But that's so that we don't get that nasty casual video game clippy thing that you see, right? Yeah. Yeah. The... And this allows you to keep everything modular. So you didn't think you, you didn't want to take advantage of motion blur at all? <laughs> because the so, elevator's going up and down? <laughs> you can't do that because that, that that would be a movie trick but we can't do that here because you never know when the player's going to be looking at anything that's true. and even if that's we're true. blurring the environment you still see the lighting scenes so you still see that something is off so doing this kind of like minimizes that that's super cool yeah that that level was very fun to do that that was actually one of the last last things i did i think by the time i did that one i was already like hey, i know what i'm doing right and that was after maybe three yeah. years. Well, yeah, three years of working on, on the game. Three. So that was after three years working. So how long was it? Did it take to do this game? <laughs> I know it took them more than the three years that I worked on it. Yeah, it might have taken six years total. I, I'm not sure honestly. And then it takes longer. I take then it's shorter to do the sequel because you have a lot of the same stuff. Or I mean, you will think that, but nope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long it took to do right now work because I left. So I don't know. I, I don't know what, this what, is I don't know what happened. Really after cool. but oh, I worked okay. on Rotten Rock for three years straight. So the, the thing is, we already knew what to do. Like we didn't, when I started working on God of War, we didn't even know what PBR was. Oh. A lot of us have never worked with it. It was brand new. No one knew. The only people in the industry that did it was Ready at Dawn when they released the order. And okay. when I came in, obviously the guys there, some of them, they knew how PBR worked, but some of them didn't. I honestly didn't know. Like, I knew a rough depth map make the model shiny, but I didn't know how to use it, per se. Yeah. Some of the foundations were there, so I just started making stuff, and then I just tailor and finance things as I went. So this would basically be 
I guess, a good example of what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so in 2015, well, in, in 2014, yeah, in 2014, I didn't quite understood how the roughness map, the diffuse map, the normal map, and the height map work together. Mm-hmm. Like, because back in the day, you just go to online and you download something and you make a little contrast and you paste it in there. And that was that. Yeah. But when you were doing this, all these textures, they all played together. And this became more kind of film technique wise. Yeah. And then the thing is that it's, with the lighting and, and this game is freaking sweet. So if you do this stuff correctly, it's just going to look even better. Right. Yeah. So something like this, for example, like I knew how to sculpt and but that's my thing. I'm a good sculptor, but I don't know how to use substance designer that well. And honestly, it doesn't matter if you know how to use substance designer that well. What matters is that you know what the end result needs to look like. Yeah. So they don't care about time or speed so much? Well, we have a schedule, but if it's something needs to take longer, it just you just have to communicate that. Yeah. But the point I was trying to make, though, is that by the time I make this texture, this is one of the newer textures. So this one was easier to do because I already knew how things play together. Right. So on these, this one was sculpted in ZBrush. But what I did, though, is that I made high maps in ZBrush. I didn't use any photogrammetry or mega scans or anything like that. It's all hand sculpted. And so what I do is that I, I make I, I make like smaller pieces in, in ZBrush. And then I, over the years, I built up quite a library. So I bring that into Substance. And then using the Substance uh, generators, I scatter them and I'm able to put stuff together. So once I have something that looks what I'm looking for, I take that height map back into ZBrush and then I keep sculpting on it. And I just keep going back That's and cool. forth because I know there's guys that can do this in, in substance from one day to the next. But here's the thing. I've seen people spend two weeks making a texture in substance that I can legit do one in yep. one hour in ZBrush. So yeah. I'm not going to go in and waste my time doing that because that's not what I do. My, my job is to put a whole level together, not to be messing around with substance all day. So yeah. I got to pick my, my, my time correctly. But yeah, mm-hmm. this is all like all PBR in the engine. So th- this would be considered a modular texture. It tiles. And then that gets applied to, to the stuff that you see in the game. And then would this be the same thing that you're going on here? Yeah, well, so these are different. So these are actual modular ginormous walls that I sculpted. You can yeah. see. With the crumble brush? Yeah, you, you, Is that yeah, what you, you can see? <laughs> so I was in charge of an area called the pit mines. And we have found this area somewhere. And I don't remember what country it was on, but basically the rock like folds into itself. It rolls into each other. So I built this uniformly horizontally with the goal of using i built a tool in houdini that will grab ribbons and it will make me my swirly rock and then i will grow the geometry into it it's like a whole thing but awesome yeah. so you're so you're good with houdini too yeah that's great i like using using the procedural yeah, system yeah, houdini yeah. like i make like little individual tools yeah. so you made the base in houdini no, no um, this is this is 100 percent hand sculpted oh hand sculpted okay so what were you talking about with houdini houdini i was using to assemble the look in the game and i don't think i put any pictures of that in here yet but okay like maybe if you go back and you see maybe there's like another thing in there yeah so that image right there the one below it this one this yeah. one so that's part of the pit mines and okay you see how some of the rock kind of curves and it looks all swirly and stuff like that i guess it's uh, hard to see because it's all clover and scaffolding but basically i built a tool that will allow me to make ribbons that will curve and then I will grow the geometry out of the ribbons and then it was like a whole technical thing that I really don't want to get into right now. But like <laughs> I use Houdini a lot here, for example, to make all the scaffolding in here. That'd be really cool to have you on here and actually demonstrate that one day. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't just, it wasn't like a scaffolding generator, like how people post online. What I did instead was I made 
modular pieces of scaffolding and then but i would do it in houdini right so this little bridge here I think that bridge was something someone else made by hand, but like this, all, all the other pieces and stuff, they were all like little modules in Houdini, and then they were imported into Maya, and then they were put in the game as just modular pieces, you know. And then oh. everything's assembled in Maya with modular pieces. If I were to make a mm -hmm. tweak to one of these pieces somewhere, it will affect all the time, all the instances of that in the level, right? Yeah, this is really cool because you have the thing about this is that you have the major shapes and then you have the mid shapes and then all the little details. Yeah, so <laughs> and it just brings it to life. So one thing I want to say though is that I didn't do this alone. Uh, I was in charge of the area and uh, I had two people working under me, uh, two junior artists, and then and okay, then one of them was in charge of doing the the sluices, the scaffolding that that the water travels on. And then the other one was in charge mm -hmm. of, after I had set everything, he was in charge of setting up, of basically polishing everything. And then after I left, this level fell on someone else's hands. I don't know after that who worked on this, but a, a lot of hands touched this level, so it wasn't just, just me. When you're texturing, like I see the cool little blue bits and the white sears, and is that, what, what are you doing for texturing? So for texturing is basically just vertex painting and different materials. We have sculpts. So like we have a sculpt and then we have this tiling material that overlay and then you have vertex paint. So they just show what you want to see. And if you don't want to see that, you cover it up. But you can also use decals, right? So sometimes instead of trying to make things too unique, you just slap a decal on the wall and then it's just cool. Mm-hmm. That's cool. I want to go back to this one, talk about your techniques for how do you, did you start this out with a very low geo that was overlaying each other? And you like, so you had these forms, that form yeah. in slices, like different geo sure. or what were your steps for doing this? Because this is really cool. So what I did is that in the middle of the image, like if you can put your mouse in there. So that piece, I sculpted that by hand in, in ZBrush. And it basically, it looked like a, it just looked like a block of chocolate, basically, right? But I was using reference, and I was making sure that it had all the ridges and all the cool, how, how it has mm -hmm. like extrusions and, and intrusions. And yeah. So it was pretty boring by itself, but it had all the shapes that I had in the reference that I was using. And so what I did then is that I took a grab dock using ZBrush. I did grab dock just to get a height map out of that piece. Uh, and, and then yeah. I took that piece into Substance Designer, and then I tile it somewhat to what you see here, right? And then once I had the thing tile horizontally and vertically somewhat close to what you see here, I brought that height map back into ZBrush and I, and then I sculpted it out. And that's when I just pretty much by hand just finished it to make it look the way I wanted it because it was the only way. So. Okay, cool. So you had this piece as a height map, yeah. you brought into Substance and just basically duplicated across, but then shifted the um, X and Y or right and left directions of it. So it's offsetted. And then you brought that out into ZBrush and just customized it so it's not repetitive everywhere. Yeah. So, like you broke yeah, it up. So I, used, I just use, I don't really use that many brushes to be honest. I really only use the standard yeah. brush, the moon brush, and I made a brush that yeah. I call the cheapy brush. It's just the trim smooth brush. The, the what brush? <laughs> the cheapy brush. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's like, a, it's basically a smooth border brush with the unique alpha. And this brush, it was actually something we put together at Sony and then we all used it. Um, but I mainly just use a lot of masking and I treated it like normal sculpting. I would push and pull using transpose and then I would extrude yeah. it out and extrude in and I would check in the game and I'll come back here and I keep doing stuff. But the end result is an actual piece of geometry that has all of this information. So this is all before Nanite. So we were already pushing a lot of detail. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Have you ever thought of maybe just as a personal challenge is doing this all inside of Houdini? Yeah, but I don't like doing that. Like it just never looks good. <laughs> Okay. Like, I feel like I will get it looking somewhat cool, but then I will probably... But then you can go on top and sculpt yeah, it. Yeah, 
But at that point, I can just do it the way I did it. Yeah. But, see, so that's a really good way that you're saying that you don't do the whole time. And you use the tools specifically for what you need it yeah, for to make it as efficient as you can. And that's, I totally agree with that. You, I fell into this pit of Houdini madness, I call it. Yeah. Where Houdini yeah. is very cool and exciting. And you go in there and you start seeing all this shit happening, but then you get stuck because you get to a point where you don't know what to do. Right. So exactly. Yeah. You have to be a, a programmer. Yeah. And that's <laughs> the thing. I actually taught myself Bex and all that stuff and I can do some very insane shit. Oh gosh. Shit, but I've always, every time, man, every time I hit a wall and then you can either be in it for 10 minutes or you can be in it for, for a whole week. So exactly. And you don't know any one that will know the answer for you that you can just quickly yeah, ask to. It's, it's just hard to find. Well, <laughs> for that, I actually do have some very cool workers that know Houdini, but even them, I will okay. show them and then go, dude, just, just take that shit and just see brush, man. <laughs> and I go, yeah, yeah. But, but why look. why bang your head on the yeah. table and then, when you and can then, just and mix and it in like, a second look, if you I'm rush one step closer to figuring it out if i can do that yeah. be that guy that figured it out but, but then honestly now the way i do it because i don't i also this causes me a lot of anxiety actually so now i just do it quick and easy yeah. and i try, and I try to have fun with it yeah Totally. That's why when I'm doing my procedural stuff, I just, in my mind, I'm just like, I'm just trying to get a base that I can just paint on top yeah. of. That's it. <laughs> I'm not trying to make it final. The problem with Houdini, man, is that once you figure out that you can do this one thing, then you go and you make it even crazier. And then, and then yeah. you kind of struggle and know that maybe this is good enough, but I could go the next step higher. And I think that's when I run into issues. This is really cool. Did you do the decide the layout on this? Yeah, so this is actually one of my favorite so, things that I worked on on God of War Ratnarok. So the story behind this is that Kratos and Atreus came to the to the Dwarven mines to find Tyr, the God of War in Nordic mythology. So this entire cave system is basically like a contest show where it's like, hey, what's behind number one? Right. So this structure you see here is the hub that connects to all of the little places that you have to go to in the level. And so this was very exciting for me because up to this point in my career, I never worked like hand in hand with a designer before. So uh -huh. I team up with John Hickenbottom. He's the designer. He's the designer that worked on this and also James Writing. And so together we iron out the layout very well and then it was very cool to work like that because we will decide where we will go where. And then after that, I, I mocked it up in 3D because we do this thing called R sheet. And then after that, R sheet. Yeah. So it's like a block out of okay. the game before all this was cool. So it's all just Maya, Geo, no, no uh -huh. texture, nothing. It's just like super cheap. But at, at that point, that's when I basically defined the shape language. And, and then Priography gave me a lot of great art direction in this. And so did the other art leads. And so we had someone come in and do a paint over this. And then when that paint over came back to me, it looked badass. So then my goal was that I wanted to make it look exactly like the paint over in terms of the shapes, because he added all this rickety scaffolding and then some chains and stuff like that. So it took a little teamwork to get this to look like that. But what I really like is that sometimes when you work on an area like this, you only go through it once and you forget about it. So you work on it for six months and that's it. But here we made it so that you have to travel through this at least 10 times. So we maximize the time that we all put in it. And then you just go through it a lot of times. But it's like a very cool place because it has a bottom area. It has a top area. It has a middle ground. It connects to another area to your left, another area to your right. You see this from the distances. It's a pretty cool place. I think you have it over here too. Yeah, so this is the same thing. Yeah, right? so yeah. this is closer. This is a closer shot to what the concept is, but this is the final one. And what's cool about this is that I didn't do this alone. Brandon Cha was the lighter in this, and he he went in there and he framed it all cool like that. And then I had Paylene Barlett, one of my juniors, work on the smaller metal pieces and most of the more dwarven looking stuff in there. But then other than that, I pretty much crafted and put everything together. So 
after I left, I'm pretty sure I fell into someone's lap and then they had to do a lot of optimization for it. But it was a lot of teamwork to do this, right? And then one of the things I wanted to do that hadn't been done yet was that I wanted to have a little wood that wasn't just like straight edges. So there's a lot of it, like zigzaggy, just a little wobbly it shapes and yeah, like, so breaking up and all these little pieces. Yeah, and, like it looks like someone um, went and cut trees. So for this together. So for all those people that want to transition to games, like how? Because when you're first working on it, it's basically film quality, high res, super crazy. What are your steps to make it game ready? It's all foundation, right? So for one, you have to know what what you're making because if you start sculpting something, you don't know what it's going to be for chances are you're going to have to redo it. First, you should always start out making, talking to design, asking what they want. And then the first step is to always make some kind of like free-handed layout of the level. But keep in mind modularity. So like when you make a tabletop game kind of thing, like you work in tiles. So mm -hmm. here, it may not look at it, but there's at least 50 layers to this, this entire structure. There's like ceiling floors poles, like reinforcement poles and all that stuff. So all of this stands from this from the center, it's like a big circle, and then it, it connects to a bridge. The first thing you have to do is just establish the modular pieces that are going to make this. The final bridge, obviously, is this insane 30,000 polygon mesh that has a lot of detail, but the first iteration of the bridge was just a Maya cube with some poles indicating that it was going to help fans, right? And so that gets put in the level and yep. then it goes through a series of iterations to make it look unique. Then at one point I decided I was going to have a roller go through it. And then you have to figure out how to, the roller gets built into it. And there's like a whole layer of detail that you don't need to be there, but I did it anyways. So all that stuff just happens progressively. The, the first thing you have to do is just understand modularity and know that if you make your kits and you blend them well, then everything's just going to fall into place. Because once you have them all put together in the level and the gameplay has been approved, then you move on to actually making everything pretty, right? If you do it backwards, chances are you're going to change it a lot. So I didn't try to pretty anything up until the guy I was working with, John, saw this. And then the directors and everybody else also played and then they all liked it. So we just stuck with it. Yeah. And then, okay. and then so you said the final poly count was 30,000. Is that what you said? Just for the bridge. Okay. So that's another thing, right? When you work on movie stuff, you don't really keep an eye out for poly counts. You just know that if your computer is not exploding, that you're okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. what I was trying to get at. It's like, you in films this would be like trillions of polys everywhere now, <laughs> here it's like that too because you want it to look cool but for example uh when i made when i made the scaffolding when i made the scaffolding i made the scaffolding as a separate okay so let me start over i basically crafted this entire structure and i presented it but once i knew what we meant, needed to do i moved on to the side and i started over just by figuring out how the scaffolding needed to look. So I can go into Seaverish and scope that out, but then you have to figure out how you're going to put it in the game. So you have to make a, a lower resolution mesh, and then you have to make sure that you can reuse this, right? Even if you're using mm -hmm. Nanite, you still have to do those things, right? So if you know your poles, so I basically have poles that were eight meters, 16 meters, four meters, and then sometimes they'll get cut and then they would, how I would make like new poles out of them and stuff like that. So all, all those things are important to know. But then it was just something that progressively happened. So the first step would be to just block everything out easy and then build up the detail, right? Then when- So you're laying it out with super high res geo and then you low res the geo later yeah actually that's what i do okay. for me it's easier to take out than to put in because if i make something that's too yeah. low poly then i'm stuck with like more 64 geometry but yeah and they have you have a account that you're supposed to be under yeah memory wise yeah. that you're eyeing yeah, on because in the end the playstation has to run this so nanite 
yeah. shit, night night, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is that when you put it on a disc and people open it up in their house, they have to run. So then you have to make a judgment call where you go, okay, what is the most important thing in this level that should not be downsized, right? So for yeah. example, the wall in the very, very back, closer to the ceiling. This one. Okay, so that. Yeah, those are very simple pieces of geometry, right? Actually, mm-hmm. no, sorry. Uh, the wall on the top left corner. That, if you were to click on that, that just looks like quadded Maya geometry. Yeah. Very easy. So the texture is doing all the work there because you never get up there, you never see it. But yeah. the wall that is in the middle of that lantern by the bridge, that one yeah. is insanely high poly. Because when you get up there, I want you to see all the bridges and everything. Yeah. And so the other trick, though, is that when Kratos is in front of it, that's when you show the highest resolution model. When Kratos is farther away from it, it, it the, the engine down reses it, right? Yeah. So in real, it's pretty cool because it just does it automatically. But here we were doing everything by hand. All you need to know is that, that like, you just need to know how that stuff works so you know how much geometry you can get away with, right? Now, I cannot talk about Nanite because I haven't used that yet, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same thing. Right. Yeah, I keep hearing that from a lot of game artists. They're just like, yeah, it's not what they keep on pushing. Like, you can't just go crazy. Uh, <laughs> Maybe for film. It might be different for film. For example, if I would have had Nanite for this scene, I would have built things exactly the same way I did them. But I wouldn't have to worry about um, optimizing so much because Nanite would have done all the optimizing for me. I think, okay. I think I think when issues arise is because people think that they can just burn their servers, sculpt this 50 million polygons into here, and then it's going to work. And that's not how it is, right? Cool. Yeah, this looks it's really neat. And, and the lighting also helps. When you have the correct lighting, you get extra detail. Yeah, man. If you just have whatever light and you like, for instance, like this wall right here, if it was just whatever lit, it looks kind of okay, probably low res, whatever. But then you get that nice <laughs> shadows now. It's like sharper edges. Yeah. You don't have those soft edges. And then you get the shadows details. And you're like, yep, yeah. there you go. It's, lighting is a huge part of making a good environment, which is why I actually incorporated lighting or incorporated a lighting tag or category in Atmo because I think you need to understand lighting in order to be a good yeah, lighting environment is very artist. Important. I unfortunately didn't light any of this. I didn't. I wouldn't expect I didn't, it to. You I have, didn't you want have to either. Lighters. I was already too busy to be <laughs> yeah. doing that. <laughs> yeah. So I had someone else do it for me, which was nice. So like this rock over here, for instance, is, is really cool with the dust and the, the dark values, like the contrast and everything. When you shaded that, were, was that just a sh- specifically shaded thing? Or was it like what you were saying before? Was it vertex painting and stuff no so that one doesn't have any vertex paint that one is pretty much a high poly model that was made in seabrush okay and we took it into substance painter so that we could make some masks out of it yeah and then that, that's how we got the look of, of that to look like cool that, right cool Let's go into the Star Wars. This is, oh, we're transitioning yeah. through your time. <laughs> you go from there to there. Was this a God of War you said was proprietary engine? It wasn't Unreal? Yeah, that was all proprietary Sony stuff. All right. So now we're actually getting into Unreal, which is a customized version of Unreal, yeah. which you can't talk about, obviously. Yeah, even if I wanted to, I don't really know much about you it. You wouldn't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess. That will try to tell me how stuff works, and I'll just go, oh, okay, I just know it works. That's okay. <laughs> I totally get you, and you're like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. So what do you see? Did you see a geo count quality jump into the Star Wars Jedi? Oh, like this absolutely. Sp- I'm not supposed to talk about these things too much, but I'm only going to say this. Okay, then just... I'm only going to say this engine pushed so much, much detail that I've ever been able to work with, and it was just... Yeah. It was fucking beautiful to work with it. It's I can't cool. wait to use Unreal 5 because I know it's just going to be even better. So I'm very excited yeah. about that. But yeah, this piece here had a shit ton of geometry. And then when I put it in the level, the entire level just looked beautiful. Because now, instead of just having a flat plane with a 
architecture on it. I have all this information in the wall. And then I didn't, this doesn't have any nanite. It's just like a decimated model. But what I do mean is that when I make my scopes, I always have what the low poly is going to look like in mind, what the player can see. So like a lot of the time I'm sculpting what it's going to look like in the end in mind. So when I'm making the low risk version of it, I never just go and decimate it. It never ends there. Like I go and decimate it and then I clean it up by hand. So to clean that by hand, I, I, I actually use Houdini to help me doing those things. So Houdini will do a lot of the edge highlighting and all that stuff. And then it will protect a lot of the ridges and stuff like that. But I still have to go in by hand and just make sure that I did preserve the stuff I wanted to preserve and all that stuff. So it was very cool working on this with all this knowledge. You know, I was able to do stuff like 10 times faster than I was able to do things before. Just by adding, That's being great. able to say, okay, I'm going to add the reduction node and then it has a tension map and then put this in. This is just like stuff that comes out of a box in Houdini. And of course, I picked up tricks from the other artists that were they were showing me stuff. It, it was pretty cool working on this project. I had so much fun working on this. You said a tension map. What's a tension map? So the poly reduce node in Houdini. Has, mm -hmm. It's not a tension map. Sorry, it's a. It, it has a little feel called retention, and so what it allows you to do is that if you make a curvature node before that, and you save the attribute of say the ridges not the cavities but okay. the actual ridges you can then promote that attribute and rename it to retention and then from that you can pretty much tell Houdini exactly what you wanted to reduce like very easily oh cool so it's like a zbrush where you mask out the areas yeah, exactly. to say hey yeah. this yeah but you're also like you just like change yeah. the, the value and then magically everything just looks better so that's really yeah. cool. I didn't know. I just use a reduce because I, yeah, because, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to start using that. And then someone showed me that. I often just go to ZBrush, whatever. But all righty. So into the world of Star Wars, the lighting is so cool. Like it's just so much more detail. Like you feel the detail, right? The quality. Yeah. I don't know how, but for the last 10 years, I've always worked on caves. So. I feel like this was the final test for my cave knowledge. And then, so for this level, basically the story here is that this is a hidden sanctuary and then the seer is the lady that you see in the screen there. She mm -hmm. rebuilt the Jedi archives, right? So Cal, so this serves as a hub for this area of the game, the planet Jedi. And so you come back here a few times, right? But it's a holy place that people have made into a dwelling. Like they all hold up in here. The whole point is that they're trying to rebuild the, the Jailer archives with the with this faction called the Narkis Anchorites. It's like a whole Star Wars, uh -huh. lots, lots of cool stuff, right? But when I saw this, I immediately was like, oh, I can make some cool, like even more carve out cave stuff in here and uh, mix that with some of the gribbles from Star Wars. It's going to look pretty cool, right? And then for, for, for all this, everything is actually insanely modular. I didn't do anything unique in here. I was, I was able to get away with so much shit because everything's linear. So yeah. I just made tons of modular pieces. I lost count how many pieces I had. It's just lots of modular pieces. And everything was like, I have a vertex painting here and there, and then I have decals, and then all the pipes and stuff, those were made unique. That, that was the only thing I made unique because I couldn't figure out how to get the pipes to look organic without actually just placing them by hand. But everything else is like all modular, all reuse, mirror builder, stuff like that. Yeah, that's a big ass doorway there. <laughs> it's cool though. The with, the with the vertex painting, I'm just thinking, how could I use that? So I have it with when I'm doing that to check a box in the engine to say act to activate the vertex painting. I'm just curious how I could use it with Arnold's and stuff like that. Just well, um, can, doing it inside it, of Maya. You could use it in a lot of ways. You could use it to reveal another texture so you don't have to make masks. Yeah. So I'm just thinking mm -hmm. like, how do you, does, would Arnold 
does Arnold recognize um, Vertex painting? I'm just curious. I don't know. Uh, I've never know. done it with Arnold, but I know in Blender it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to experiment with that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, this is really cool. The atmosphere and the haze and everything on it is also really cool. Good job, lighters. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to shout, give a huge shout out to a lighter. His name is Sam Castillo. Uh, Sir Santillo. And uh, we call him Mr. Stylish because he's a, uh, very good at what he does so i had a lot of fun the texture over here is really cool over here yeah, yeah so i actually that- hire the same person i work with on the apple core mine on the metal war stuff painting and and mm-hmm. then i hire her out of sony so she could come help it help here so she made she made the archive textures and all this stuff and, oh cool yeah and so when you're building the stuff, are you thinking about story? Okay, they've been standing here for so long, or this guy, this thing's interacting with that. Like, how? what made you decide to put these things in the, the places they are? <laughs> That's the one million dollar question. Yeah, what happened was that there was a concept for this that kind of already had a lot of this place in. The only thing I didn't like about working on this project was that we didn't have a lot of time to do things here. I played it safe, man. I just look at the concept that was made, and then I came up with the recipe, and I just beat it things. And then once yeah. I had a room looking a certain way, then I will go in and give it a little spin up. So here you can't really see, but this is a huge room that connects to other smaller rooms, and then it's a three-tier room, so it has three more floors. And so once I had things looking okay-ish, then I would maybe add something extra, but I didn't have the luxury of, of giving each corner more character like I would have liked. But I mm-hmm. think players still appreciate that some of these have their own flair going on. Yeah. Right. So these light bulbs, for instance, right here, you're teaming up with the lighter on that or are you modeling this yeah. and then so, telling him hey so, so that's it. actually something cool here that uh, that dictated where i was going to put things so i would do an initial pass of where i would possibly put gribbles all the machinery and stuff and yeah. then i would let sam go in and he had a lot of preset light stuff that they were using for the entire game so i would let him place those now, the problem with that is that if you play something, then I wouldn't be able to move the stuff anymore. So usually we will communicate a lot and I would say, hey, look, dude, this is not going to move. So just go in and place this. So that was very cool that we did it that way because he was able to go in and notch with the lighting to make things pop even more so you could see the shapes and, and all the details yeah. of all the texture and everything that's in there. So when you were texturing this light bulb, because you have it, it's what's what makes it look more realistic and natural is that you have the fall off over here, so it's bright here. And yeah, then so it tapers. They, and, they made some very it, cool material that had parallax in it, and I don't okay. know how it works to be honest. I just know that if you are playing the game and you actually look at that, it, it looks like it has an interior, but it's just it's, it, it's a solid mesh. It's just the parallax map is making it look like it has an interior. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a very cool thing. Like, all the lights have the same thing. So that was a lighter that did yeah, it? Yeah, they were in charge of the okay. and all that stuff. No, yeah, cool. so all those that's light cool. pictures, they were like universal light pictures for the game. I was just, I was okay with that. <laughs> I'm not going yeah. I'm not, I'm not to make a case out of something so trivial. I'm like, yeah, dude, just put whatever you want in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. Let's check out the these sculpts over here. These are cool sculpts. Yeah, so this is and this you, is an example of modularity. So you just make one and then you can tweak it and then you end up with a full set. And then these are the five pillars that make up the entire base, basically. Yeah. That's cool. And it was all just in ZBrush, I assume? This, this was a, a unique sculpt. If you close that, I can show you the sculpt because I have it in my image. So yeah. Yes. So this is what I sculpted in ZBrush. And so any architect knows that pillars have three main parts. You have the base, you have the body, and then you have the capital. So my, my thing has always been that if you if you make the capital and the base, then the body, as long as it tiles together, you can go on into infinity, right? I didn't know how 
So the, the spiller thing need to be, and the, the bigger things get, the, the, the more resolution you lose. So it's very important to just make a modular piece and then repeat it as many times as you need to. So I built this, right? So this actually tiles onto the bottom of that, up to the top of the base, and it tiles to the bottom of the, of the capital. And then I go into, once I make the low polys and everything, I just assemble the stuff I need in Maya, or, well, in this case, Blender, and I import it into the engine. Okay. Why'd you put, why'd you do it in Blender? Because uh, at that point, you're dealing with the low poly. You're not dealing with the scope anymore. Okay. And when you're sculpting this, you say, you do, I could see this definitely being sculpted by hand and everything, but you have a pack of alphas that are getting bits like this, or are you doing it by no, I'm just, I'm just uh, doing, drawing your I'm own just alphas? Do it by hand. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I usually <laughs> just draw with a masking tool, and then I, I use the transpose tool, and I push it out, and then I use another brush. Yeah. And, I don't know, man. When I sculpt, I do it old school. I don't know how else to do it. <laughs> so you, so this one, let's go back to this real quick. So basically, you just, yeah, you don't see the seam. So this is the tall yeah, one. Yeah. And then you probably dupe that, but you don't see the seam of the two duplicated pieces. Yeah, exactly. And then. How are you blending the seam? Is it well, with the, there, the deco? There's no blending needed because the way it works is you just make sure that there's a certain way that you do this. But basically, the, the main idea is that you don't touch the end caps of the sculpt. You leave them okay, like plain so you don't create a, a seam by sculpting in detail there. But then when okay. you make the low poly, you just got to make sure that the UV style. And so when you bake it, you immediately you're just going to get a, a nice continuous mesh. Yeah, cool. And then like the broken pieces, they're not even sculpted. All I did was just cut them with Blender. And then I just added. Cool. I'd like to see your your actual workflow and making like a modular piece like that. <laughs> That'd be useful to know. Yeah. Uh... I just go balls to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is gonna be cool to see. I don't know if we actually have any game art in the community, but we'll check. Let's just jump over there. Just see if there's any game art yeah, yeah. Um, that you can maybe give some feedback on. Yeah, I'd love to. So the, the community is all the non-senior and senior whip work that's being done. And you can also check out for recruiters out there. You can just quickly, if you're looking for a junior or mid artist and filter out through there. And you know that the homepage is all senior quality work. So you can just go to the homepage if you're looking for senior plus quality or people to hire. Okay. So the open to feedback is any image that actually wants some like harsh criticism or it's just feedback stuff. You can obviously comment on any image that you want, but this is they are really open to it. Let's see. Do we have any game art in here? Unless you see something you want to talk about. Uh, no, whatever, man. I'm happy. Well, for me, sometimes it's hard to critique new stuff because. Yeah, I told you. I yeah. I, I, I never <laughs> um, know what. Do you ever work on big terrains like this? Uh, no, not really. No. Usually my levels are very close and then I have to, to do that. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's actually any game specific stuff. Let's see if this actually. Yeah, we got to get some more game artists on here. <laughs> get your students to upload their stuff and get your colleagues. <laughs> yeah, I'll let them know. Okay, I guess we'll just skip that. So I really appreciate you coming on here, yeah, man. Yeah, thank you, man. I, uh, Let me get out of the sharing the screen and actually see your face. To talk to you, I was listening to all your previous interviews. There was a lot of very good insight there. People should definitely check them out if they haven't yet. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you gave awesome insight here. It was awesome talking <laughs> to you, learning, getting to know Thanks, you. Man. Maybe one day we'll actually meet each other through a, a work event yeah, or something <laughs> i'd have to i'm in tennessee okay. so i'd have to go all the way to california yeah i, I uh, move up north and northern california too so i'm very far from the office oh okay yeah. but <laughs> are you in san francisco or are no, you I'm in um, the monterey uh, area okay yeah. cool all right work from home forever <laughs> <laughs> yeah by the beach <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome <laughs> All right, man. All right. Thanks. Thanks again. Um, yeah, thank you, man. And keep in touch. I can't wait to see what else you share. There's also a Discord, Atmo Discord. Oh, really? um, oh, really? Yeah, you're welcome to you're welcome to hang out in there if you want. Yeah, yeah. I, um, send me a link and I'll go on there. 
All right, excellent, sweet. So you hear that, guys? <laughs> you can ask some other little questions if you want. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we'll hang out over I'm, there. Uh, I'm my door, my this, so anyone who wants. All right, cool. There's actually there, so there is a. Let's see if I can actually pop up the Discord. So I'm trying to organize the channel so there's different departments. I really like all the so, effort that you're putting into doing this. It's very. Inspiring. Oh, I appreciate that. Thanks. I feel like environment artists are always lost. Yeah, man. We're like, the, like there's we're like the janitors of the industry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, we legit make seventy five percent of everything on the screen, but pays attention to it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And our station is just completely full of either non photorealistic stuff. So map painters get buried. And then you have just creatures, characters, anime stuff, concepts everywhere, and then boobs. <laughs> it's just you like know, our it's, station used to be cool, it, but I, now everybody just puts stuff there. So I don't even know. I don't even know. If it's yeah, it's just, it just became a giant. Yeah, so that's why I'm trying to keep Atmo just very organized. And yeah. and part of the roadmap is actually to, so I am doing, I am an environment artist. So I started with environment artist. That was my, my game plan, the whole thing to be environment. But now then since I, uh, as things, as I work out the bugs and stuff, I want to eventually have it where I can have other departments like creatures, huge effects or comping, but have it at the top of the screen where you just hit that and it completely changed. It, it makes like a duplicate of the same kind of system, yeah, yeah. like you have the app group seniors and everything's still organized, but it's just that where it's not just, oh, everything's there and messy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah, really appreciate yeah. you putting the time to do this. I know from experience that it takes a lot of time to do this kind of stuff. So I'm glad someone else is doing it. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, in the product, so yeah, I'm actually just go back real quick. So we can actually discuss if you have a little extra time yeah, I can yeah, discuss little yeah, features yeah. that maybe people don't know up here there is the income survey which i think is very important for people to fill out so if that could go viral that would be amazing because i feel like a lot of people don't know how much they're actually worth oh yeah and so now it's all completely anonymous so you don't know who's whatever is making you can put it in there and it's Let's see. So you have like your art directors, concept artists, environment artists, game environments, map painters. If I was to duplicate it into like creatures, I would just change the categories yeah, yeah. to creature related. And then you have your supervisors, leads, principal artists, and et cetera, et cetera. And you can just filter out to, you'll see the highest income and then you'll see the average. So eventually you'll be like, oh, I didn't know I could actually make that much in that yeah. field. You know what yeah, I mean? You know, that's the thing about like, the industry, man. Like, I feel like some people, they just want a job. So exactly if they get paid they just go in and do it but they don't know that they could get compensated properly so they can live well and that's very important yeah it's yeah uh, people are just dying to get in they get taken advantage yeah. of and yeah so i'm just trying to empower the artists to make better try to get a better income yeah, yeah. and then there's the product page which i am still adjusting currently i'm just posting stuff on there but i want to also be able to make it where it's products but only at most senior approved people can put their work up there or like their tools their courses oh, cool. whatever packs and stuff yeah. so then because that's the thing with our station that also annoys the crap out of me is you're looking for something as well this could be made by a junior <laughs> you don't even know if it's yeah. like <laughs> yeah, actually, that's actually right <laughs> I'd be looking for a tutorial, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I don't know who made this, but it's actually pretty cool, yep. or I don't know who, who let this in here, you know? Yeah. Is this even, like, good advice? Shoot. <laughs> yeah. So that's in, in, in the meantime, like, right now, I'm just trying to figure out, like, the best setup for that, and then, so... Currently, it would be like if you wanted to sell something on there, you would hand it to me and I would set it all up. But eventually, I want to be able to make it where you could just do it yourself, like Gumroad inside of the website. Oh, cool. That's part of the roadmap. Uh, yeah, I actually uh, would be that. interested because I like to make passive income on the side with random stuff like that. Okay, yeah. awesome. Cool. We'll talk about that then on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, sweet. All right. And then there's the blog post that I have some people uh, contributing. If you want to contribute also, yeah. I'll put that on here. Whatever blogs you have. This is a matte painting blog. I actually have a, a lighter that I work closely with Apex that he's going to upload his blog okay. onto here. And so you can do that as well. And yeah, just keep on growing. Try to make this just the ultimate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm going to keep checking it out.
All right, cool. I appreciate it. So that's that. Thanks for coming on, man. It's awesome getting to know you. Yeah, you're, you're super talented. Thanks, man. Talk to you later. Yeah, see ya. Bye.